Welcome, everyone. My name is Tony Kokomo, president of the DFW BIM Infrastructure User Group, and also president of uh, Civil Cal Learning Solutions. And today we have Rena, and she'll be doing a tips and tricks over Revit. So, Rena, if you don't take, take over. Absolutely. So, welcome, everybody. And I'm sure we're going to have some more people uh, trickle in. Today, I'm going to be talking about something that is very, very near and dear to my heart. I've been involved with Autodesk products ever since the late 90s. Yeah, it's been a long time, um, which includes AutoCAD, 3ds Max, you name it. I have used and taught a lot of Autodesk products. However, it's Revit that really, really appealed to me in the sense of the intellectual challenge it offers, in the sense of, the, of how intuitive the software is and how intelligent it is. So I am an uh, expert elite uh, member, I'm the BIM manager at uh, Fishbeck. We are a full service AEC company in, in the Midwest. Um, so not only am I an expert elite member, I'm a Revit certified professional. A, I am a Revit and AutoCAD subject matter expert. Um, during the, now this is my daytime job. After dark, I put on my superhero cape and I teach architecture and print reading at Kalamazoo Valley Community College. In addition to that, I'm involved with the Kent County Technical Center as an advisory board member. And I go in, spend time with the students, evaluate their projects. You just can't get me out of the classroom. All right, so let's get started with the good stuff. I have a lot of information to share. I'm going to be talking super duper fast. And uh, when I get carried away, I'm going to be talking faster. So feel, uh, feel free to hold your questions until the end for Q&A session. So let's take a look at some ways to get set and go with your Revit project. Your project template does not have to be an RTE file. Revit does offer you some pre-made templates. We've got architecture, structure, constru uh, construction. Um, to get started with a project, you don't have to use an RTE file. Something that we've been doing a lot of has been to, especially for work shared projects, has been to create a sample project. Uh, let's say we've got a project that we like, which works well for us. We can go ahead, do a save as, clear all the geometry out. And that leaves us with the settings that allow us to build upon and create a whole new project. Save that in a library, open that as a detached file, and we are able to save that as a new project and work on that as a new project. Just one of the things that you need to keep in mind is don't overload your template. It's a template, it isn't a library. Try to, uh, try to divide and rule, try to keep um, your families in family libraries. That, that would mean just one area to keep updating. You don't have to manage families at multiple locations. Also, if you can take things like your settings, view templates, um, wall types, and uh, ceiling types, for instance, drop them into a container file. A container file is a file that only has those components, does not have any geometry at all. Uh, and you would be able to either do a copy and paste or a transfer project standards to bring all of those items into your project. Now. Every year, the software does upgrade. And depending upon your company policy, you will be upgrading your projects, you'll be upgrading your templates. Now, a bad habit that I've seen happen a lot has been you go ahead, you're upgrading to Revit 2022, you open the old Revit 2019 um, template and just do a save as. Not a good idea because this is what, uh, what I see in my, my project journal. Now, when I see a project save history, a document save history that goes back from 2022 back to 2013. That's a cause for concern. And here's why, as a software up, upgrades, um, certain features will be upgraded. Some features may just be eliminated. And that causes a, a certain amount of disconnect between the versions, which may threaten the fidelity of your project. It may threaten the integrity. It may cause element corruption right on the worst end of, this, of the spectrum. This may cause actual project corruption. You do not want to deal with that. You do not want to come into your project and see that your project is dead. You can't open it. It's happened to me in the past. Never want to wish that on anybody. So in order to rebuild from scratch, open up a clean vanilla file. 
And then the first step would be to go into manage and transfer project standards. Once you've done that, you can copy in your view templates, you can copy your fill pattern types, your text styles, dimension styles, all of those can be copied over into your new file. With that includes view types and view templates. Once you've got that done, uh, you can, your, your browser organization has also been copied over. All you need to do is create the views, associate them with the correct view templates, uh, create the sheets, mock them up, and you're all set to go. And of course, you would need to test, 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 and test. Something that really helps to speed you up, keyboard shortcuts. Now, there is a PDF cheat, cheat sheet online. I'm pretty sure you've already seen that. In addition, you can create your very own keyboard shortcuts. And once you have the keyboard shortcuts created, you can export them out to an, to an XML file. That would allow you to then go ahead and import the, the contents that set up uh, custom keyboard shortcuts into your own machine. You can set up keyboard shortcuts for uh, Revit commands. You can also set up keyboard shortcuts for anything from an add-in. You can set up shortcuts for, um, in, in my case, I have got PyRevit. Uh, you can create shortcuts to any add-ins that you have. Other customizations that you can set up. If you click on file and options, you can set up double click options. You can maximize your comfort levels by customizing background colors, by hiding non-relevant tabs. So if you don't need to see the structural tab, don't. You can just go ahead and hide that tab. You can set up the view disciplines. And you can also set up file locations, but uh, file locations will only see, if you, if you set up the file locations to see the templates, it will only see RTEs it will not see the sample Revit file that you may have created. All right, what about the mouse? We've already seen what we can do with the keyboard. What can we do in the mouse? Some old friends that we are, that we are all used to. Uh, click and drag to move and control click and drag to copy. You can also try to move with nearby elements. And as you can see in the, in the GIF, you can also try to click activate uh, dimensions and um, you know, if you if you click Control, Shift, and Drag, you can also create aligned copies. So there's a lot that you can do with your mouse. Double clicking, you can customize double click behavior by by going to File and Options. You can double click to edit the families. You can double click to edit boundaries. What about selection? Let's take a look at some selection tools. You can customize selection tools. When you go into modify and select, you can specify whether Revit is going to select links for you or underlays or pinned elements. At the bottom right of the screen, you also have these tools available to you. My personal favorite is using filters. I just go ahead, go into a 3D view, randomly window over the entire model. And once that is done, I open up filters and I uncheck what I don't want to select. And I just keep the category that I want to select checked. Remember, this will only allow you to select categories. If let's say you, there are specific groups of elements that you're going to select and reselect and use and reuse all the time, go ahead, create selection sets. Uh, you can save out selection sets, you can edit them, you can give them a name and they are there and they are ready to be selected anytime that you need to reuse elements. One of Revit's major strengths is the ability to control visibility. You have got this virtual model, you've got this imaginary camera, you go around, click, 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 take pictures, and you have got views. Uh, you set up view templates to control the views and show what you want, not show what you don't want. Being able to control visibility, being able to control the abilities of that camera is what makes Revit so very popular, so very powerful, I'm sorry, and it is popular, of course. Um, another feature that we do in Revit is we can take uh, models from consultants and from other disciplines. We can confederate them all together with our own model. We can link in um, consultant input into our own model. And once that is done, we can actually go into the links and we can control the visibility of elements, basically show what we want to show, hide what we don't want to hide. So 
In that case, what we do is we set up filters. We can set up a whole new filter. We can select the categories that we want to control. In this case, I have got casework furniture and furniture system selected. Right now I've got them all selected because once I've got this filter set up, I can half tone all of these items, all of these categories. Maybe I have got a, I've got furniture showing up in the floor plan, but I want it to be grayed out. I can also go ahead, I can hide these categories. Um, now Revit has got this nifty little tool that allows you to enable or disable the filters. So you don't have to remove filters from, from view templates if you don't need, need to use them, you can just go ahead and disable them. My personal favorite while I'm working on a view template and I'm testing out the view template, just to make sure that the view template selects what I want it to select, I just go in, I override the lines, I make them a very pretty pink. It's awesome, the pink really pops and it's just, it's just a nice thing to see when you're thoroughly busy and you may be kind of bogged down and stressed out. Pink always helps. My personal favorite tip, and this is something that I am going to push because currently what we do is we bring in the other disciplines models into our model. And then suddenly, you know, you look at the floor plan and you see two, three, four, multiple sets of grids on your floor plan, which we don't want to do. We end up having to go into our, our links and we go in and we turn off the, the grids category out of annotations. No more, we don't have to do that anymore. When you go into manage links, select the link and go into manage work sets. In this case, you do need to mandate that everybody who, who links their files to yours must have their grids on shared grids and levels. Just close the shared grids and levels. Work set, it's not going to come in. One less thing to do. My personal favorite, one of the things that I love doing is playing around with schedules. You play around with schedules, you control them. It is an awesome, awesome feeling. And Revit 2022 gives us a really nice tool to be able to split and pay, place schedules on multiple sheets. Previously, if I had to take uh, one part of the schedule, place it on one sheet and then on another sheet, I would need to duplicate the schedules and then crop them down, filter them out, no more. Now you can actually go in and you can select the schedule and Revit will give you a choice as to the sheets where you want the pieces to be placed makes life so much easier. I could do without multiple copies of the schedule. However, here are some tried and tested old is gold tools that I've used all the time. And again, another one of my favorites, door schedules. And we do have a situation where our door schedule shows in one column, we show the number of panels and the width of the panels. Those two are two entirely different fields. How do I combine them? I go ahead, I click on the combined parameter tool. I select the parameters that I want to combine. In addition, I can set up a separator. If I want, let's say if I want the width to be in parentheses, I can set up a prefix, a suffix, whatever it is that I want. And now this is what I end up with. I, I, I have combined the width and the height of the door in the schedule. And now I see I have, um, I have a field for door size, and I see that the width and the height of the door are combined with a nice little X separator between them. That is absolutely awesome. Definitely beats the other way that I've seen people going. I have actually seen models and door schedules where the door size is a text uh, parameter and they enter it in and that just makes me cringe. You don't want to do that. Formula driven parameter is my next favorite. You can go in to the formula tool, name the formula that is going to set up the name of the field that will that would result. And this allows you to select from the fields that are already present in the schedule. And you can you can just use your regular uh, regular symbols to add, subtract, multiply, divide, square root, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to set up the formula that you want. Conditional formatting. This is an old workhorse of Revit schedules. In this case, our situation was that we had to um, shade existing doors and we do have an existing parameter. It's a yes, no parameter. You check it for existing, leave it unchecked for new doors. And we wanted to hide the existing column and we wanted the existing doors to be shaded. In order to do that, we set up conditional format. We set up a condition where existing needs to be equal to yes. 
and that went ahead. That shaded the existing doors really nicely. For added punch, try orange or pink. Key schedules are a hack that, uh, that have been used to create dumb, dumb schedules, basically tables in Revit. So in, when, when you are setting up a key schedule for something other than what they were actually meant to be, which was to provide information to your regular schedules, try to use a never used category to create the schedule. A lot of times these would be pre-created in the template. Now here we, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we have, I have seen situations where the key schedules are used as an easily editable way to compile information on the sheet. Now, in case an updated version of the same key schedule needs to be brought in to the current project, here's what is really weird. Revit will not overwrite the, the key schedule on the destination project. So here is what I like to do because uh, what happens is we've got the, the key schedule coming in we have got the keys with the same names and Revit goes, oh, we've got a duplicate over here and Revit will just blow the key away. So in this case, here's what I like to do. I take the key schedule in the destination project. I rename the keys. I just add a one. That's all that works. And then I copy in the, the new, the source key schedule in and it works really nicely. Let's take a look at some really fun stuff working with geometry, families, things, all kinds of other things. Some easy peasy stuff. You can load families by directing, by directly dragging them into the editing area from a Windows Explorer window. That speeds things up so very much. You're not navigating over to folders. All you do, you have the Windows Explorer open, drag, drop, and your family opens. Uh, you can do the same with. Um, you can you can do the same for opening families. You can place family instances by dragging the family type directly from the project browser. So from the project browser, you can right click to open families. If you have the types expanded, click drag the type over into the editing area and you're all set. Now, when you have got two families with different materials, you want to transfer the materials over between the families. You can go ahead and use transfer project standards, but this is going to bring in all the materials. And if you've got materials with the same name, they will overwrite the materials in the destination file. If you want to transfer specific materials between families, um, you can open both families and just copy and paste a piece of geometry with that material into the new file. If you want to create a custom family template, in a previous life, uh, we had a variety of casework templates with different counter types. In order to do that, you go ahead, you create the family as you normally do. And then in Windows Explorer, you change the file extension from RFA to RFT. And then lo and behold, you have a custom um, family template. In addition, I wonder if you were aware that it is entirely possible to get rid of parameters that you don't want. If you have a family of a certain category, you go ahead, switch the family category over, let's say to generic model, and you may be able to get rid of a bunch of hardwired parameters that are native to the original category. Sounds weird, but true. Linked models. And this happened to me recently where uh, a coworker contacted me. They were having trouble recreating a stair from a linked model because the, the linked model was just there as a starting point and was going to be detached later on because we didn't really need it. And this team member was trying to recreate a certain custom stair. What we ended up doing was tab click to select the stair, uh, control V to paste it in the destination model and hey, we were done. Easy way out, right? Easy peasy. Not only that, if you copy and paste a family, the family comes in as a family and you're able to do whatever it is that you normally do to families. Some new stuff. And this is, uh, this is a tip that I absolutely love, love, love. If you are working in projects which are really, really equipment heavy and inventory heavy, you're going to love this. Previously, if I had to tag multiple elements with a, with a tag, I would go ahead and copy and paste in the same place, no more. What I do is I select the tag, I go to add or remove host. Now, a couple of caveats to that. Supposing that you're done and you do not want this tag to point to 114 anymore. 
while this points to multiple hosts and you go to pick new host, Revit is going to go, uh-uh, I'm not going to oblige. What you need to do is you need to go ahead, remove the additional host so the tag goes back to pointing at one host again, and then you can pick new host. Totally awesome. It, it works, it works, it works. And another favorite thing that I like to do, I've got this pointing to something and we have got the, we've got the free leaders. They're not attached leaders. If I hit select host, then I know exactly what it is that the tag is pointing to. A postscript, this, uh, this little thing that shows me the number of elements, it's not dumb text. That Using dumb text in situations like this is something that really makes me cringe. It just, it's worse than fingernails on a chalkboard. What I've got is I have uh, added in a count parameter. I've created a label in, in this tag. I have created a custom shared parameter. I've called it count. It's a text-based parameter. And once the tag is placed, all I need to do is enter the values. And we're all set. By the way, the X, I haven't typed it in. That is, that's a suffix that has been added to the label. Something else that I absolutely love. In previous slides, especially when I was creating new templates with a gazillion sheets and I had to recreate the sheets. Holy moly, that was a pain. There was a lovely tool that comes from Ideate which is called the clone sheets tool. And I just love that I would clone sheets along with uh, legends, along with schedules. It was wonderful. But what happens when you're in a situation like I am now with no ID8? I cried, I cried for ID8. It was, I missed it so badly. It was terrible. And now Revit gives me this. I'm able to duplicate empty sheets or duplicate sheet detailing. That includes legends, that includes schedules, absolutely wonderful. And even more importantly, duplicate with views. Here's what you need to understand though about this tool. There is a disclaimer. When you duplicate the sheet with views, it also duplicates the views. So it duplicates the views, adds a number, uh, a numerical suffix to the view name. You need to be very, very aware of this because you may end up with a bunch of unsheeted views on in your model. And that has been known to bloat the model, clog it down, cause all kinds of problems. You will never be able to live happily ever after. Uh, a tip to get rid of the duplicates, besides of course being really on top of the views that were duplicated, go ahead, create a view schedule and delete the unsheeted views. Please, please, please just get rid of those. The invisible line trick, one of my absolute favorites, use it a lot, been really helpful for bulkheads, really helpful for overhead monitors. You're going to see a lot of those if you are working on entertainment projects or on retail projects. What I have in my monitor family is I just, in the front view, I just dropped an invisible line. Not too long, just long enough to touch the cut plane of my view. In addition, uh, I need to tell the geometry to not be visible in plan. And I do need to have symbolic lines placed in the reference view of the family so that once this is placed, all that I see are is the footprint of the family. Complex sweeps. If ever anybody has told you that Revit sweeps can only go in two directions, don't believe them, point and left. Here's what I've done. Now, I love walls. I love Revit walls. There, there's so much you can do to them between um, editing the profiles. You can make them spiral. You can make them do whatever you want. You can give them sweeps. It, it, Revit walls are absolutely fantastic. So what I did was I've taken a super thick Revit wall, cut into it with voids. And once I have the voids, this gives me 3D edges. So when I go in to model in place sweeps, I can pick the path, pick 3D edges, and I end up with this absolutely wonderful thing over here. A point to remember, however, this capability has its limitations. Really sad story. You might actually weep when you hear it. I got super ambitious and I added in uh, a wedge-shaped void. I was just trying to cut this entire shape on an angle. I have no words. The sweep just went kaput, it went kablooey on me. Here's what happened. When I tried to generate the sweep after having picked the, the path, this curve swept beautifully, starting from this point, going around the bottom curve, swept beautifully. It was only 
around about this area, this particular segment of the path, which was going at an angle, which just broke the sweep. So you need to keep in mind that when you're trying to do stuff like this, try to keep it as simple as possible, avoid complexity. If things get too complex, maybe you'd be better off dealing with 3ds Max, Rhino, whatever it is that you have available, SketchUp. To create custom railings, did you know that you could actually go ahead, um, grab a profile from a detail component family, or just the line work from um, from a um, from a profile and drop it into and drop it into a railing. In a previous life, I had to create a railing where they did not want the 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 uh, W section beam to be modeled separately. They wanted to follow the railing. They just wanted to model the railing and the beam in one go. Go figure. So. To do that, a rail was created and to that I added in my custom rail profile. I created the custom rail profile by copying and pasting out of the detail component for that particular beam. Worked beautifully, they were happy. That's what matters, I guess, right? Uh, model families, especially when you are modeling specialty equipment, for instance, uh, done that a lot. It's really frustrating when you, you think that you have put REF in the refrigerator family and the text doesn't show up on your plan. Create that as either dumb text in a generic an annotation family. That is the key. Or else, if you want to have something that is intuitive, uh, instead of dumb text, go ahead, create a label, and uh, nest the generic annotation family into your specialty equipment family. Associate the label parameter to, um, to, the, uh, to the model or a corresponding parameter that gives the value that you want in the host family. And that, that label will then be intuitive. It will, it will adjust itself according to the value in the host family. A really neat application for this, if you really don't want to get into um, specialty equipment and stuff like that, just create a generic box family, put in uh, the generic, generic annotation tab and create types. So, you know, for the generic box family, you've got a type for a copier, a type for a refrigerator, a type for a popcorn maker, whatever. And it just has the information that you require in, its, uh, in uh, a parameter. And our label, our generic annotation family label is associated to that parameter. So you've just got one family doing the job of a gazillion. Now voids, I, I've got a love-hate relationship with voids. I can make them do stuff, but too many voids can really get in the way and can make themselves a nuisance. Of course, now with um, starting with Revit 2021, actually, we do have a cuts geometry parameter. Previously, you would have to play with the visibility of the voids if you wanted to control them. And it was just, it was a lot of effort. Now you have got a cut geometry parameter. You go ahead, you associate this to a corresponding parameter in, um, in, in the, the host family and you are able to control um, the void. In addition to that, we have got something, uh, a tool in the form of face-based void family. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, you can create a face, start with a face-based family, create a void object, set up dimension parameters, instance-based dimension parameters for that void. And now you have got a family that when entered in and used with the cut commands, this will cut anything, absolutely anything. And you have got control over the dimensions of the void. To control face-based families to unhosted families, open both families in the same Revit session. And, you know, just with a simple control C and a control V, transfer the geometry from the hosted family to the unhosted family. Hosted families, they are a, they're kind of a double-edged sword. They are convenient in the sense that, you know, boom, they, they go ahead and they host to the walls and you, you're not doing things like aligning things in place or moving them and stuff like that. They can be really helpful, but they will get in the way in case you have to a copy and paste stuff from of um, you need to sorry you need to move or rotate stuff rather um, then a hosted family can get in the way or let's say you are in a situation where you need to you've got something that needs to be repeatable let's say an apartment plan it, you you group it so that you can repeat that create repetitive units and in that case the hosted families can get in the way unhosting them would be a good idea. 
Now we're going to talk about in-place models. Again, something I have a love-hate relationship with. In the case of this project, which by the way, I have brought with the express intention of showing off. Uh, with this, in-place models were my friend. Everything, a lot of what you see started as an in-place model. And let's see how I was able to keep, keep in-place models at a bare minimum in this. Firstly, we do have the tried and tested old tool where you have in-place geometry created, you stay in the edit in place mode, mode, group the elements, and then you're able to export the group out as a family. That is one way out. Because in-place models should only be used for one instance, otherwise you end up with something like this happening. I have seen a model, complete horror story, is going to make your hair stand on end. I opened the model, there were over 300 copies of an in-place model. And my question was, why was this not converted into a family? We ended up with this absolutely super bloated project browser. And all of us know how hard project uh, scrolling through the project browser can be. However, to minimize the in-place models, here's what you can do. Just stay in at the edit in place mode. Go ahead, copy the geometry over. So in this case, I just had four instances that I needed. I copied the geometry over. In my project browser, I still had one in-place model. Or you don't have in-place models altogether. One of the biggest complaints against Revit families is you cannot create a family in context. So let's say you have got a, a piece of custom furniture that you want to create and the shape of the furniture is dictated by the layout. As you can see in my little example over here, I've got this absolutely crazy wedge, wedge shaped space and I want to have some kind of an island uh, which follows the outline of the walls. So here's what you can do. Two things that you can do as a matter of fact. While you are in the in-place mode, sketch, copy the sketch, paste it into the family, or just go ahead and model it. If that is what you need, if the model, if uh, things don't need to be really, really complex, go ahead. While you're in the in-place mode, model, copy, paste it into the family, and then you can go in and apply constraints and parameters and then cancel the in-place model and then you would be able to insert the, um, the family and use it as it was supposed to be. All right, workarounds. We have been talking about some workarounds as a matter of fact, haven't we? Some more workarounds. The rotation parameters, the things that you need to keep in mind in this case, uh, this example shows how it is to develop a rotatable arrow. Maybe we're going to use it for north points. I use this a lot. This is something that you're going to see in all of my plan view titles. Start off by creating the line work, set up a reference line, constrain it to the intersection of the reference planes, and then you are going to select tubes. You're going to select the line work and you're going to host it to the reference plane, uh, to the reference line, I'm sorry. And then you can constrain the reference line, set up a rotation parameter and that it will work wonderfully. Now, it has been noticed, it has happened in the past, it's happened to me a lot, where when I'm testing the rotation parameter, it may break at values higher than 180 or 270. If you take the, the offending family and you nest it into another family, the parameter would work correctly. One of the mysteries of Revit, one of my favorite things, one of my totally favorite things, because you can, when you're setting up a label, you can go ahead, you can drop multiple parameters into the label, as long as you set up breaks, you can add in, prefixes, you can, you can add in suffixes, and what you're going to see on the sheet is going to be something like this. When you do a slow double click, not a quick double click, if you do a quick double click, then you're going to be editing the family. You go click, one, two, three, click, and it will bring up this lovely dialog box. You can go in and you can enter the values that you want. Quick note, in order to make sure these values are editable in the dialog box, you must, must, must add all of these shared parameters. Remember, they must be shared parameters and they must be added to your project and associated with the appropriate category. In this case, they were associated with, uh, with the project information. Formula-driven dimensions. I use this a lot, especially when I'm doing um, curtain walls. So in this case, I've got a curtain wall and I want to have um, the middle panel 
at uh, 3,900 millimeters. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of, I was just on a roll. I used millimeters instead. Go ahead. I know that I'm, I'm in a non-millimeter environment, but you know, just don't judge me. Don't judge me. So what I wanted was I wanted the central panel of the curtain wall to be 3,900 millimeters. The two side panels needed to be equal. Here is what, what I did. I locked the dimension of the central panel. I locked the overall dimension of the curtain wall. And I went ahead and activated one of the end dimensions, entered in a formula. Guess what? I ended up with two beautifully equal panels on each side. Didn't have to calculate, didn't have to do anything. Why? Why do you want to calculate when Revit is going to do it all for you? Similarly, Global parameters. Global parameters are kind of like this big spider. You know, it just sits in a high place with its long eight ten tentacles or legs or call them whatever, and is able to control multiple things. That's what a global parameter does. I can set up a width global parameter, and I can use that to control the value of multiple doors, multiple windows, anything that I want it to be. And you know what, these can be formula driven too. What, what my favorite use for this is, I go ahead, I set up a rotation value and I use that to control the rotation of all the north values, arrows in my uh, view titles, because let's face it, Revit is smart, but it has not figured out how to give us a smart north arrow that will actually respond to the actual location of true north. How can we have a conversation about tips and tricks without talking about stairs? Has this ever happened to you? Where you have a stair with an angled uh, side boundary and when you go ahead, look at it with the material, this is what the material should look like and this is what it looks like on our stair. Here's why that happens. My pattern needs to be perpendicular to the, to the edge of the stair. In this case, the edge is angled, so my pattern is angled and we end up with a hot mess. Please remember this look, this behavior is local to stairs. Floors don't do this. You can make floors any way that you want. And the pattern will do whatever you want it to do. So one solution to this is go ahead, model the treads as floors. Maybe you can have thin floors. Maybe you just have six inch thick floors and you forget about it. Or you can just take the easy peasy low tech way out, which makes me cringe, which is filled regions. I wouldn't do that. Here's what I did. Again, we go back to modeling in place, right? I go ahead into a section view, model in place. Um, I select the, uh, the lines, I use pick lines to select the outline of the offending stair. I go ahead, model, the, model a nice rectangular stair, and then I put in voids. While I'm still in model in place view, cut the stair, and I end up with a stair that looks absolutely wonderful and beautiful just the way I want it to. Talking about calculations to backpedal a little. If you need to convert units in Revit, don't even bother with your project units. If you just type in um, the, the unit next to the number value, Revit will do the math for you. It'll convert the dimensions to be whatever, whatever units you want them to be. All right, now how do we boost Revit and BIM 360 performance? To upgrade BIM 360 projects, please, please, please do not download and open and save and reinitiate your projects. You don't have to. BIM 360 does it all for you. Go ahead, use the tip, and you can you can pick whichever version it is that you want to upgrade to. Um, BIM 360 will run a test for you. It will give you a report. It will tell you if there are problems which will not allow the project to upgrade and it will upgrade the entire project. You don't have to go in and just chip away at things. Now, um, growing up, one of my favorite authors was an author called Annette Blyton and she came up with these kids adventure series of stories. You know, we had a group called the Secret Seven. They would just go out camping, you know, have adventures, solve mysteries, um, make the local cops lives miserable. And um, so now what I have is the BIM 360 Secret Seven, which is, and a lot of 90% of BIM 360 issues can be solved by using the Secret Seven. You need to empty the collaboration cache, desktop connector cache, make sure that you have the latest versions installed, daily publish. If, if at all it is possible. Um, selectively publish views, 
never link from a local drive to a cloud shared project. This is something I've seen happen a lot, especially when you are linking um, input from a consultant. It may be a Revit file, it may be a CAD file. Always, always, always tra uh, transfer the, uh, the file up to BIM 360. And um, access problems, most of the time you can remove or re-add uh, re team members who are unable to access the project. Maybe you would need to check their entitlements, definitely check their permissions, and that should solve most access problems. Another Enid Blyton group of child superheroes, the famous five, four, four humans and one dog. By the way, Tim was my favorite. Don't overmodel, please don't overmodel. A lot of what I've talked about, you know, with the modeling in place and things like that, that was uh, all an exercise in avoiding overmodeling because with, uh, with Revit, the number of elements also does affect the mobility of the model. Please don't forget about the Revit 20 mile limit. There are, whenever you have a model which has an extent larger than 20 miles, you may end up with wonderful problems happening like you may not be able to see the views correctly, things like that might happen. So please be mindful of that. And let me warn you, a lot of times the 20 mile limit may be violated by a CAD file that has been brought in. Once upon a time, what happened to me was that the CAD file that was brought in and that triggered off the 20 mile limit warnings, it had an invisible line, invisible line in the Z axis. When the CAD file was opened, nobody really saw it. When, when it was inspected in 3D, we saw the 20 mile uh, long invisible line and, and that had to be deleted and that solved the problem and um, left me with, definitely left me with a few more gray hairs. In place components on an as needs basis, try to keep them as low as possible. Again, load families as an ad, on an as need basis. Your project is not your library. Please do not go ahead and load all of the doors in the doors folder into your project because you may need them, not going to happen. And you know what, as you're working and you see a family that has not been used, feel free to blow it away. You can always reload uh, the family, but if your project crashes and if it dies and you're not able to open it, then that's going to be a whole different kettle of fish. Okay, some more words about keeping the model clean. You need to maintain your model. Maybe um, every day, of course, you do have, uh, you're, you're going to create locals, you're going to publish your Revit Cloud models for BIM 360 projects. Now on a weekly basis, and this is important, open with audit. A selective purge. Now these two are things that maybe the, a project coordinator or project manager would need to do. Um, compacting while saving. If you go ahead, save, sync, and compact. Compacting the model can bring the file size down. And um, interestingly, if you sync with compact twice or thrice, that would rewrite the entire database. And that again is another way to troubleshoot a, a troublesome project. Review warnings, keep them to a minimum. And I've got this in a box and actually this box should have been read. Please avoid nested groups, please, please, please. As far as possible, if you're using groups and you may need to use a group, ungroup as far as possible, clean out the groups that you're not using, going to purge unused, blow them away and avoid the urge to nest groups. And if you need to, if you've got a group that you need to mirror, then you should go ahead, ungroup and then mirror or you go ahead and you create a whole new group. I mean, that is that has been a cause of a lot of problems. Now, it has happened in the past, you're on a roll, you're not too sure about what you're, you're not really paying attention to what you're doing and you've got a whole bunch of stuff in the wrong work set. If you delete the work set, then Revit will give you this uh, warning and it'll prompt you to either delete the elements on the work set or move them and yay, you can select the work set that you want. It takes a few minutes, but it's well worth it. The temp folder, when you are in trouble, the first line after did you restart your machine is did you empty the temp folder? So there is a link over here to, um, and you can Google this too, about deleting Revit's temp folder. Delete, delete, delete. The worst case that I have seen was 1.2 million files. And 
they were, they were just wondering why it was that their machine was running so slow. Interestingly, Windows 10 now has a temp folder cleaning utility built in. So if you enable storage sense, you could set it to clean out the temp folder on a weekly basis and that can make your life so much easier. CAD, a lot of input comes to us in the form of CAD files. It may be from other consultants, you know, I've seen I've seen input from kitchen designers come in as a CAD file, which needs to be linked into my file. But you know what? Even if you link a CAD file into a Revit model, you're going to end up with a whole bunch of garbage. If you look at your line patterns, you're going to see a bunch of import line patterns. Now, if you have got a tool like PyRevit, for instance, that would help you to blow them away, or you could use Dynamo to blow them away. Um, so you do want to avoid importing CAD Please do not import CAD at all. That causes a whole bunch of problems. And please do not explode an imported CAD. If you need to bring in information from a CAD, it should be linked. Or if you want to bring in information from a CAD into a family, then you would need to import the CAD. But in that case, I would strongly recommend modeling over the, the CAD and then blowing it away out of the family. You don't want that to happen. See that a lot in um, manufacturer families. Uh, even in, I've seen this a lot in furniture manufacturer families where they just, they they take their existing CAD information, import it into a Revit family. Hey, we have Revit content and they're really happy. And what they have created is a problem, a potential problem for us in our model. Now, there is a, a workflow to making sure that CAD files are sanitized before bringing them into, before letting them have anything at all to do with Revit. And in spite of all that, bad things can still happen. True story. A consultant CAD was loaded into our model and you'd open the model, you try to do anything, you would have, we would get this little error, which, to, uh, which mentioned the CAD file by name, drove everybody crazy. A stage arise, uh, uh, arrived when we weren't even able to open the model. It turned out to be that the consultant works in microstation and they take their microstation drawing and they export it out to AutoCAD and they send it to us. Believe it or not, this is only one of the few issues that can uh, occur with microstation. So how, did, how was the problem solved? A clean Revit file was taken and the microstation based CAD file was linked to that. And then the resulting Revit file was linked into our model. It was linked in, adjustments were made to the view template, life was wonderful, haven't had a problem ever since. Another issue that can take place with linked DGNs, you may bring in your DGN and discover that's really tiny compared to the rest of the model. Just take it, scale it up by 12, you'll be fine. Uh, to get rid of drawing imports, just take a quick look at Purge Unused. You might find something there, take a look at object styles. Of course, object styles and imported styles will uh, important objects will only tell you that you've got some CAD stuff happening over there. Dynamo. Dynamo has been my good right hand to, in keeping models clean for a long time. Try some third party tools. Try Magic Utilities. The drawing check, it will list the CAD files. It will tell you whether they're imported. Uh oh, this was bad. This was actually really, really bad because this was a model that would not open. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. You, you can see. Uh, what was imported, you can delete stuff as you wish. CTC also gives us a BIM manager suite, project cleaner, import and link manager, which allows me to, uh, to remove, to see whatever's going on and remove any imports. Favorite errors. Are you sick of this? You see this um, name entered is already in use. This happens a lot. I've seen this happen a lot with grids, for instance. Go ahead, use a schedule. You um, use a schedule and the schedule will show you what has been placed, what has not been placed, delete what has not been placed. So when, when you see, so if let's say you want to place grid nine and you see there's another grid nine, go ahead, delete the duplicate grid nine and you'll be, and you'll be fine. Where did the demolished door in, infill go? In order to fix this, go ahead and fix the wall profile. Edit the wall profile and that will take care of this error. Why are my copy monitor elements different? I've gone ahead, I've copy monitored um, a hollow structural column and it shows up as 
a rectangle in my model. You want to go into copy monitor options and you want to make sure that the new type is set to the correct family. Why do line, line weights and materials in the family look different in the project? That's because whatever is set up in the project will overwrite anything in the family. So um, anything that has the exact same name will be overridden by whatever exists in the, in the project. If the central model is not currently available, you want to go in to file and options, you want to set the work sharing update frequency to manual updates only. Or while you're editing geometry, it happens a lot where you would see these constraint related errors. You Clicking remove constraint, it's not going to hurt you. You may need to just reconstrain the geometry. And this would actually get rid of a lot of the bad constraints that are getting in your way. My personal favorite, cut and place the geometry. Or check the other views. Maybe you know you already have this constraint applied in another view and Revit does not take kindly to repetition. Had this happen a lot where suddenly I get this frantic call that you know I did something and uh, but I want but I want whatever was done in a previous version of my model maybe you know stuff that I was working on last week. I want that back in my current model and I can't backpedal to that. So in that case you want to in BIM 360, you want to look for the versions and you want to download the source file. So you can then open the downloaded file along with your own file and copy and paste the elements that you want. Please remember, if you go ahead and you restore the old version, it is going to become the current version and it's going to discard the current version. So you want to use this tool with extreme caution. Now, supposing that you want to dig out information, you want to do the same thing, but the BIM model has not been published lately. So you go into manage cloud models and you go into view versions. When you're in view versions, you will be able to restore an older version. Now, what if you don't want to restore the older version? Because if you're going to restore older version, Revit, um, BIM 360 is going to warn you that this is going to discard the current version of the model. Here's what I like to do. In BIM 360, I go ahead, I take my original model and I archive it. I move it over or I download it. I make sure that it is placed in a safe location. And then I go ahead and I, um, and I go back to the original model and I, uh, I, and I restore the old version. So that way I still have my original model and I have the restored version. And I can go ahead and swap out elements as I need. Toolbox tools. Dynamo script to, um, has this ever happened to you that you're trying to purge out textiles, but Revit sees something in your model that has that textile, you don't see it, you can't see it, as a matter of fact, and as a result, Revit will not purge out the textile. Go ahead, run Dynamo, Dynamo will give you the ID, ID numbers, so here are the element IDs for the sheet for the um, for the textile that I want to um, purge out and yeah, red sheet notes, nobody wants that. Once you have these ID numbers, you can go ahead and select by ID, blow them away, you will, and red sheet notes is going to be history. Pyrevit is my absolute favorite. I use this all day, every day. I mean, hats off to Esan. He's really done us a huge favor by coming up with this. By the way, the word Esan does mean favor. So a lot of stubborn stuff that you can't get rid of. Unpurgeable viewport types. Yeah, that's a pain, isn't it? Unused filters, view templates, empty elevation tags. Pyrevit will blow them all away. My personal favorite, especially when I am working with manufacturer families. Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to create your own families all the time. Go ahead. Download something from a manufacturer website or from BIM object. And once you have that family on your machine, wipe the model components. That will get rid of a whole bunch of, of irrelevant and redundant parameters that are littering up the family. Absolutely beautiful. Scan for corrupt families. Use Pyrevit Family Quick Check. And this will now show us that we have got corrupt families in the model that can help to prevent a whole bunch of grief. Imagine Utilities actually has a room phase copy tool now. Hallelujah. So now you can take the rooms and copy them 
from, from um, the new construction phase to the phase of the current view. And you can also select the, the level that you want those rooms to be copied to. Absolutely wonderful. And with that, I am done. Uh, Tony, have I gone over? I think I've gone over. I may have gone over, haven't I? Oh, that was really great stuff. I was trying to keep up <laughs> with all the tips and stuff. And uh, uh, some of the users were saying like, man, this is a lot of good tips. So, all right. Uh, um, but no, no, this is really good. Uh, we did record the video, everyone, that there are, people are still on, and we're going to post it on YouTube. And then uh, and, uh, Rena is going to also post it on her social media platform or wherever she's going to post it. So we did record the video. So, uh, But uh, no, really great stuff. Um, and I uh, also want to say, everybody, that it's still online. Um, starting about seven minutes ago, Autodesk is uh, celebrating their 40th anniversary on their Zoom call. I'm going to post it on the chat. Um, here we put it right now. There's the blog. So if you click on the link, you can go to the website or this website. There, there's a Zoom link where Autodesk is hosting the, their live Zoom call right now for their anniversary. I think their official anniversary is Sunday, but they're doing it right now. Yes, it's already. But no, this is really great. Um, I'm I just kind of I'm a very very young beginner on Revit, so I'm All on right. the civil side. So um, and I like to at least know you know how to handle data back and forth if I wanted to because I do have Revit. I want to be able to go and make a couple of simple uh, tweaks <laughs> if I wanted to. So, uh, but really great stuff. So uh, I appreciate you coming and presenting for our user group. Uh, and we're yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, it was really good stuff. You know, it's, um, you know, we've had a couple of people come in, but yeah, this was a lot of <laughs> tips. <laughs> so really good stuff. So uh, does anybody, I think some people had some questions, but you actually uh, went through and answered it while you were doing the presentation. So um, really good stuff. I, I did see one about uh, cleaning up bloated Revit, yep. Revit files and models and, you know, purge and use is your friend. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you, you showed some kind of app that does some cleaning or something on there. So, um, but really great stuff. So um, looking forward to, I'll send you an invite for, for some other uh, expert elite um, meetups we're going to be doing here in the next few months. And Looks so, and uh, in events. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. And be sure to go attend our uh, Autodesk event here and I will see you later. All right. All right. Thanks have a great everybody. day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great right. one. Bye. Bye.